Previously on Grace to You. Our culture not only allows for the destruction of the family, it aids and abets it. Our society makes laws to destroy the family. Parenting is the greatest influence your children will ever have. And parenting is God's plan. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, starting last week, I, I said that we were going to talk a little bit about family. And we've titled this brief series, Shade for the Children. We started with an old Chinese proverb that says, one generation plants the trees and the next generation enjoys the shade. The question we asked is, is this generation planting any trees to shade the next generation? We might be convinced that it is not. A recent survey posed a question, and I'll just sum up what's going on with just a couple of comments from this survey because we're all aware of this. You don't need statistical evidence. But I thought this was interesting. The question on this national survey is this, is the ideal home a marriage where the husband provides and the wife cares for the children? The answer was yes by 30 percent of the people. That same survey posed another question to unmarried people, do you want to get married? Forty percent said yes. Sixty percent don't want to get married. Seventy percent don't think an ideal home is a marriage where a husband provides and a wife cares for the children. Because of this, we are looking down the barrel of an apocalyptic cannon that is going to devastate this culture. Marriage and children in stable homes with providing fathers and caring mothers is fast disappearing. And I'm not here to discourage you about this, I'm just here to tell you that this is reality. But it is not new. It is not new. After the fall in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, the curse of sin was unleashed on human society. The man was cursed, the woman was cursed, the land was cursed, the universe was cursed. And therefore, society was cursed. Sin was unleashed in every imaginable form, but still the Word of God hasn't changed. And God's design for family hasn't changed. Let me remind you of what I said last Sunday as kind of a foundation. Marriage is a blessing. The Bible calls it the grace of life. You want the best of life? Marriage is the grace of life. That is God's intention for it. That is His design. Marriage is a blessing. Second thing I told you last time is that children are a blessing. Children are a blessing. They are where two become one. Children are a heritage from the Lord to enrich us to bless us, to encourage us, and when we get old, to support us, (laughs) care for us. So marriage is a blessing, God designed it so. Children are a blessing, God declared it so. Parenting is to be joyful and fulfilling. Parenting is to be joyful and fulfilling. The fourth principle that I gave you, and I want you to think about it again, is that parents 
have the responsibility to shape the character of their children. Parents have the responsibility to shape the character of their children. For the sake of society, for the sake of civilization, and for the sake of the kingdom of God. The focus in the home is not on the children, it's on the parents shaping the children. Parenting is to be joyful, it is to be fulfilling, but it is the responsibility that dominates the home as you endeavor to raise children with character. Parents have the most powerful influence. They have the most powerful influence. Why? Because you have them 24-7, because they arrive in this world in your arms. And much of what is going to determine their lives will happen in those first five years when the world doesn't even have a great influence on them. Your intimacy, your love, your devotion, your discipline, your instruction, so very, very important. That's the first lesson we teach children. Marriage is a blessing. Children are a blessing. Parenting is intended to be joyful and fulfilling. Parents have the responsibility to shape the character of their children, and parents have the most powerful influence. And finally, I told you that parenting is God's plan. Parenting is God's plan, Genesis 1. Have children, fill the earth. And after the flood, chapter 9, flood subsides, Noah and his family are told by God to do the same thing that Adam and Eve were told in Genesis 1, have children, have families. How can we do what God has called us to do? We can't do it in our own strengths. That is why, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, and we could actually start with verse 15. Be careful how you walk, not as uh, unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. The recognition you live in a pagan world. Certainly believers in Ephesus did. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, that is dissipation. Here it comes. Be filled with the Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who leads us into worship, who speak to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, sing, make melody in our hearts to the Lord. It is the Holy Spirit who leads us to give thanks for everything that has come to us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we offer thanks to God for it. It is the Holy Spirit who enables us to submit to one another in the fear of Christ. It is the Holy Spirit who causes wives to be subject to their own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. It is the Holy Spirit who causes husbands, verse 25, to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. It is the Holy Spirit who is behind all of this. This is, this is the necessary environment for parenting to be effective and successful. A wife who submits to her husband as to the Lord. A husband who loves his wife as Christ loves the church. A husband who is in a temporal sense as well as in a spiritual sense her sanctifier, the one who keeps her pure, the one who allows her to show her glory, the one who works to see her holy and blameless. So we come then to chapter 6, and let's look at verses 1 to 4. I'll just read it again. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, we can extend that to parents, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord." That's a very short verse, that fourth verse, isn't it? Very, very brief. There's a negative aspect to it and a positive aspect. The negative aspect 
is in a sense the opposite of the positive aspect, and it demonstrates for us the fine line that has to be walked between a loving discipline and instruction and provoking children to anger. Now last time we looked at the submission of children, uh, verse uh, 1, they are to obey their parents because it's right. There are some things that are right because God deemed them right, but not just obey them. Verse 2, honor your father and mother. This is an attitude, obey in everything, no limits, honor the spirit of respect. You obey as children, you honor because it's right, because the Lord commands it, and even adds a promise. The promise is in Exodus 20, verse 12. It is in the Ten Commandments. It is the first commandment with a promise, and the promise is long life, so that it may be well with you, that's quality, that you may live long on the earth, that's quantity. Obedient children live out their lives in fullness, both in terms of privilege and blessing and time. Now children don't come into the world knowing this, right? They don't come into the world obeying, right? They don't come in the world with a reverent, honorable attitude toward their parents. It's essential to teach children these responsibilities because you're trying to overpower their fallenness. That precious little baby came into this world as a sinner, a frightening sinner, and potentially a deadly sinner. One writer put it this way, every baby starts life as a savage, completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants when he wants it, his bottle, his mother's attention, his playmates, his toys. Deny him these once and he seizes with rage and aggressiveness, which would be murderous were he not so helpless. He's dirty. He has no morals, no knowledge, no developed skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, all children are born delinquent. If permitted to continue in their self-centered world of infancy, given free rein to their impulsive action to satisfy every want, every child would grow up potentially a criminal, a thief, a murderer, and a rapist." Now there are actually people who believe in what is called presumptive regeneration. There are people who believe that if you take that little savage and sprinkle water on him, he all of a sudden becomes some kind of, some kind of uh, saint. And you can now presume he's regenerate because of this baptism. If you're presuming that your little savage is regenerate, you're wrong. You have a great task. As a parent, it's, it's an incomparable task. Your, your task is to walk that very thin line between infuriating your child and disciplining your child. Proverbs says that the instrument that you use for this is a rod. That's right, a rod. And if you don't use the rod, as we saw last time, your children will grow up to grieve you, to sadden you, to humiliate you, to disgrace you. They will become, Proverbs says, disasters. It is essential to raise a disciplined child in order to see the promise of a blessed and full life. Proverbs 4.10 supports this promise. It says, Hear my son and accept my words, and the years of your life will be many. Read Proverbs 4. I won't take the time to do it. Read Proverbs 4. Read Proverbs 5. Read first part of Proverbs 7. It just keeps saying the same thing. Listen to instruction. Listen to instruction. My son, listen to instruction. 
When you raise obedient and respectful children, they have the promise of a blessed life and a full life. The tragedy of our society is that parents are concerned about what their children look like. They're, they're concerned about fashion, physical appearance. They're concerned about academic achievement. They're concerned about athletic accomplishment. And seemingly they have very little interest in character. But the command of verse 4 to parents is very straightforward. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It's not a command that has anything to do with what they wear, what they achieve academically, athletically, economically. It's all about the discipline and the instruction regarding things of the Lord. So let's look at that verse 4 tonight for a little bit. This is how parents are to submit. You are to submit to this duty. This is the top side of the authority submission standard that upholds the family. Parents lead and rule, but also submit to a God-ordained, loving, spiritual, disciplined authority that does not abuse the children. The Bible says, you fathers, you fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Don't do anything that makes them angry. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's contrary to the culture, that culture, this culture. Fathers is the term patera, Greek word patera, usually used for the male of the family, but sometimes it is used to include the mother. In Hebrews 11, uh, I think it's verse 23 where it's referring to Moses' parents, this is the word that is used. So it is a word that can mean father or it can even stretch to include parents. Certainly it includes the idea of the headship of the father because that's been discussed in chapter 5. He is the lead parent. He is given the primary place of leadership, but it also includes the mother. That's why in Proverbs 4, 3 it says, listen to the instruction of your father and your mother. Both need to be involved in bringing up a child mentally, physically, socially, spiritually. Now specifically, what is the parent's responsibility? Twofold. Let's look at verse 4. Do not provoke your children to anger. That's very simple. Don't make your kids mad. Colossians 3.21 puts it this way, fathers, parents, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. You can literally suck the life out of them. You can cause them to be angry and frustrated. Do not provoke your children, by the way, is used only here and in Romans 10.19, the noun form means irritation, an intense form of irritation that infuriates the children. Don't do what angers your children and causes them to become embittered and exasperated and they lose heart. They give up trying to please, trying to figure out life. Our authority must never be abusive, never irritating, never embittering. How do, you, how do you do that? How would you provoke your children to wrath? Let me give you a few illustrations. There are a lot of ways to exasperate your children. There are a lot of ways to provoke your children. One, you can do it by overprotection, and people do. Fence them in. Never trust them. Never give them an opportunity to develop independence. Don't allow them to think for themselves. When they make a suggestion, tell them it's stupid. Deprive them of any contribution. Make them feel second class. Look, if you want to develop a healthy child, that child needs to feel loved and listened to and heard. He needs to be able or she needs to be able to express himself or herself. Little by little, that's how they become refined. Hear them. Take some risks. Give them a little rope. Grant them some independence. Don't be overprotective. Another way that 
parents make their children angry is by favoritism, by favoring one child over another. I wish you were like your brother. He never gives us any trouble. This is a kind of... Uh, this is kind of Esau Jacob story, isn't it? Rebecca preferred Jacob over Esau. Sad results are well known. Don't compare them against each other. Don't make one feel inferior to the other. There's a third way that you can exasperate your children or provoke them to anger, and that is by pushing achievement, which in my experience is usually to make a parent look good, really never about the children. Some parents literally crush their children with pressure to excel in school, in sports, so the child becomes literally bitter because there's never a satisfactory level of achievement. They're not all capable of achieving what you would like them to achieve so you look good. Another way to make your children angry is to fail to sacrifice for them, to make them feel like they're an intrusion into your life. I'm busy. I'm busy. Could you please go away? You're bothering me. Or you let them go off in a corner and do their work and struggle and you're too busy to pay attention to it. Make them fend for themselves. Don't ever do things with them that they want to do. I remember having a conversation with a couple of young boys years ago, and one of the boys was talking to his friend about his father liked to play with him. And I remember this pensive statement from the other kid talking about his father who was a youth pastor. And he said, oh, my father never has time for me. He's too busy with other people's children. The crushing. You have to make them feel like they're the most important person in your world. Take them places they want to go. Do things with them they want to do. Another way that you can cause your children to be bitter and angry is by failing to allow them to grow. Let them make mistakes. Let them goof up. Laugh when they're offering ridiculous ideas. Don't condemn them. Don't expect perfection. Just progress. Let me ramp it up a bit. Here's a way that you can really wound your children, a form of abuse, by bitter words, by bitter words. You have the most powerful vocabulary in the house. Far more words are at your disposal to crush your child than your child could ever match. You throw your vocabulary around and you say things to your children that you will never get back. Crushing words, devastating words that break their hearts. And do I need also to add physical cruelty? Sometimes I think sarcasm and ridicule is worse than physical cruelty. Now all of this is a challenge for us, isn't it? It's a challenge. But this is how it works. If a child lives with criticism, he learns to condemn. If a child lives with hostility, he learns to fight. If a child lives with ridicule, he learns to be shy and afraid. If a child lives with shame, he learns to feel guilty. If a child lives with intolerance, he learns to be angry. On the other hand, if a child lives with tolerance, he learns to be patient. If a child lives with encouragement, he learns confidence. If a child lives with praise, he learns to appreciate. If a child lives with fairness, he learns justice. If a child lives with secure love, he learns to trust. If a child lives with approval, he learns to enjoy himself. If a child lives with love and friendship, he looks to find love in the world. So we don't want to provoke our children. 
Now the positive side. On the other hand, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bring them up assumes they're not going to get there by themselves. You have to do it. It doesn't happen by accident. You could actually start by recognizing that bringing them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord involves two things. It involves evangelizing them, and then it involves edifying them. The, the word there for discipline is actually paideia. It, it is the word for training, learning, instruction, discipline, chastening as applied to a child. It really means rearing a child, training by rule and regulation, enforced by love and rewards and discipline and punishment. You do all of that. Susanna Wesley, the mother of seventeen children, including John and Charles, once wrote, the parent who studies to subdue self-will in his child works together with God in the renewing and saving of a soul. The parent who indulges self-will does the devil's work, makes religion impractical, salvation unattainable, and does all that is in him to drown his child, soul and body in hell forever. So we, we want to nurture these children. We want to discipline them, rear them in the instruction of the Lord, nuthesia, meaning verbal instruction, listen, with a view toward judgment. Verbal instruction with a view toward judgment. Let me make it very simple. The worst problem your children have, the worst problem your children have, the worst matter that they face, the most devastating reality in front of them in the world is the wrath of God. It's the wrath of God. The best promise your children will ever hear is the salvation of God, right? So this is such a great responsibility, but we have a great God and a great message. Give them the gospel in as rich a way as you can, and then continue to edify them with the Word of God. If you would like more information about the Ministry of Grace to you, or to access our vast library of resources, visit our website, gty.org. We can also be reached by phone at 888-57-GRACE or email at letters at gty.org. To correspond through mail, our address is P.O. Box 4000, Panorama City, California 91412. Thank you for joining us today. We're thankful for your continued partnership, which allows us to advance our mission of unleashing God's truth one verse at a time.